I'll start the recording here. We'll go ahead and get started. So thank you everyone for joining tonight. So this is the Bocce Coaches Training for 2021. Uh, this will count as your certification slash recertification um, pending some participation here. We just ask that you are active uh, in the discussion tonight. We have a few polls, uh, some videos. So we've tried to make it as interactive as possible. Um, and I think that the information Rennie present tonight will be very helpful to everyone. So uh, one extra piece, please make sure that your name uh, that you have under your picture here is the same as it is in GMS. That is a huge help and saves some time. Um, <laughs> makes it a little bit of a puzzle <clears throat> uh, if it's different there. So that's a huge help. And I'll make sure I have everybody's names here. Um, and at this point, Rennie, I will pass it over to you. Okay. Good evening, um, everyone. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Let's, um, the, the intent of this training is it should be a two-way conversation. So if you've got questions, comments, as we're going through the slides, you know, don't hesitate to push the space bar and unmute yourself and ask your questions, and then we can go from there. We're going to go over a summary of the rules, um, some of the training consideration and equipment. We're going to look at the divisioning process, but this year I'm not going to spend as much time on divisioning process as I have in other years. And then finally, um, Ryan has been good enough to add at the very end some additional resource uh, links and everything that we can have. Um, Next page, right? I kind of want to re remind you that um, sometimes what I have in, in this document um, isn't always what we end up at the state for our competition and stuff. So please keep in mind that when we do have competition, if we have it this year, but definitely next year, um, they will, you know, those rules will supersede anything that I have in the presentation. Uh, the, the dimensions for bocce is it, you know, by now most people I'm hoping are aware it's ought to be 60 foot long, 12 foot wide with the foul lines marked. In this case, they've marked with the red for the foul lines and yellow for the mid court. When athletes play, um, the, you know, they have two sets of four balls. It here, it says, um, you know, one set um, is green and the other set is red. Uh, go to L.L. Bean and you'll buy red and blue, green and yellow. So the colors aren't important as, um, as long as the, the balls meet the, the legal requirement. Um, and sometimes having a variety of colors can actually be helpful. We've got some um, visually impaired athletes and um, he can't distinguish um, the green ball from the green grass. So now we use for him on the court that he's at, we use uh, the yellow ball and the red balls. Then he doesn't have problems. He can see things much better. Next slide, please. Um, the games, um, the length of the game, 12 points for singles as well as doubles um, and um, 16 points for the team plays. At competition, at the state competition, we often see where we're limited to 30 minutes. I've even seen it as low as 25 minutes. Um, at the end of the competition, if both teams score ends up at 12 points or whatever the score is, let's say it's an eight to eight games or they hit um, at the end of the time limit, they end, end up with exactly the same score. Then it's a tie game and we always play an additional frame. Whoever wins that frame wins that particular game. Next slide, please. Um, sequence and 
I'm following my notes here because I've got extra notes as I go. Um, sorry. The, um, so one so, side will have one color balls, the other um, side um, will have the other. They'll play, they'll roll the balls in the appropriate sequence and we'll talk about that in a little while. Uh, most athletes will throw underhand. Uh, some athletes uh, will throw overhand it's not as common, but it's, it's acceptable. Some athletes may even throw with both hands. That's perfectly acceptable also. Um, an athlete must stand behind the, the foul line. So the red line, you can see the picture here, where the athlete must be behind or can have his foot on the line. I usually coach my athletes to stand behind the line because once they get on the line, that they, that they edge of their toe past the white line or not, that gets into a judgment call. But if their toes aren't touching the white line, then we know for sure that the uh, throw is going to be legal. Next, next slide, please. At the beginning of, of the play, so at the beginning of the competition, the there's a flip of the coin that whoever wins the flip not only gets to determine what color ball they want, they also can choose that do they want to uh, toss the Polina first. Um, so they get all of that. Uh, if whoever throws the Polina first, whoever has when it's time to throw the Polina, they get three attempts at throwing the Polina. The Polina must always go beyond the center line, in this case, the yellow line. If the athlete cannot throw the Polina beyond the yellow line, and remember the other team gets one attempt at throwing the Polina across the yellow line. If the athlete does not make it across the yellow line, then the referee will place the Polina on the center line in the middle. If the athlete does make it across the center line, then the opposing team, the team that has the Polina in the first place, gets to throw out the first ball because they still retain having the advantage of throwing the first ball out. Next slide, please. So we go through this and you're confused and you're not sure you want to question a rule again, please. Um, stop me. Um, so after the first, after the Polina and the first bocce ball has been thrown, the op opposing side then rolls the next uh, ball. After the second ball is de delivered, we now look at whoever is the closest to the Polina. Whoever is the closest to the Polina steps outside of the court and the other team comes in and tries to roll their ball closest, closer to the uh, Polina. And I want to emphasize here that um, there is no rule as to which of the on teams, there is no rule as to which player goes first, which player goes second. It's all up to us as coaches to determine that. So there are strategic advantages playing one athlete first or another athlete um, second. Um, there are strategic advantages of having an athlete throw the first ball or, or his first ball 
and not getting closer to the Polina, you can then alternate to the your other athlete when it's a team. Or you can ask that same athletes in the doubles to throw the second ball. Our preference in Montgomery County is we'll have the same athlete throw their second ball after their first ball and their first ball doesn't get close enough to the Polina for them to score the point. We'll have them throw their second ball because we find that they adjust their throw a lot quicker and a lot better when they do it right away. Again, for some athletes it works, other athletes it doesn't. So it's truly up to you to go. And so, you know, we, we're at that point where whoever's the closest to the Polina stands down and lets the other team roll the, the ball. Any questions here? Next slide, please. So again, a reminder, whoever's the closest, in this case, the red ball, the red ball stands down or steps out of the court and the green ball will throw. And you just go back and forth until you're, you're done. Um, any questions? Let's go to the next slide. I wanna go over on some of the strategy of the, of the game. Um, you know, somebody asked me, um, how many balls is each athlete allowed to throw? And they said, we couldn't find it in the rules. So I went looking through the SOI rules and the link is on the last page of the, of the presentation. And if you go in and you look under rule 4.8, the number of balls that can be played by a player, it, it's quite explicit. If you're playing single, the rule says that that player can play four balls. If you're playing doubles, the rule says that a, a player is allowed to throw two balls. And if you're playing four players on a team, then each player is allowed to throw one ball. Right now, when you read this rule and you look at what we do at the state games, all of a sudden it makes a lot of sense. You know, sometimes people will say, well, wait a minute, we're playing doubles and one of the team members got sick that day and they couldn't make it. Why can't that one athlete by themselves <coughs> throw all four balls because now he can only play two balls and the other team is throwing all four balls. There's kind of a disadvantage. Well, it comes and you know, at the state games, we say, no, no, that athlete can only throw two balls. The other two balls you know, that belong to the other player, we can't play it. They can't be played at all. It comes from this rule 4.8 because an athlete is given a limit of how many balls they can throw. Yeah. Uh, again, I want to emphasize the order of who plays and how many balls are thrown <coughs> is entirely up to you, the coaches, and it depends it really it depends on how your athlete plays the game. So if you want on teams, you want one player to throw two balls in a row, then teach them that, coach them that way. So when they get to state games, they do it automatically. Remember, we can't coach them at that time. So we can't tell them, oh, go throw your second ball. You missed that first time, but try again. We can't say it. They've got to naturally be able to do that. Um, keep an eye out at the beginning of the competition. Make sure that the volunteers at the state competition aren't messing up your strategy. You don't know how many times I've gone to Luch or Denny or to um, the other folks that are there 
and say, hey, you need to go talk to the volunteers because they're alternating players as to who they throw. You know, where I've seen that Joey and Jack are in a particular thing. And then the volunteer will say, Joey, it's your turn to throw. And they'll say, Jack, it's your turn to throw. And so you go through that frame. And then on the next frame, they'll say, Jack, it's your turn to be first. And then Joey, uh-uh. You know, if that's not your strategy, if that's not how you taught your team to play, say something. Don't let them control that. Um, again, who throws first and who throws last is entirely up to you. There are, in some cases, I'll have somebody throw first so they'll place a blocker because I know that that athlete is good at placing a blocker. And then the next athlete always throws long or always throws differently, but that blocker is there, which helps prevent other the other team from scoring. And at this point, another thing that you can do, and I'm gonna show you a video that we took at practice. This athlete had never done this before, but two Saturdays ago at practice, she, um, she did this. Now I gotta remember, how do I go to share? And So notice Mary Jo went out there, threw the ball, didn't get it close yet. The green ball's still there. You know, there's the green ball. Mary Jo's throwing the red one. Mary Jo throws it again, and look what she did. Now she's got the point, and she's got an even a second point there. So Alexa now is got to throw her last ball. And Alexa's ball went way past it. So now I'm telling Mary Jo, go out and throw your last ball because Alexa's out of ball. Mary Jo picks up her balls, goes back behind the line and everything else. And you notice what she did? She just tossed that little ball just past the beyond the line. That's a legitimate throw. And we've been teaching our athletes for quite a while. Some get it, others don't. This was Mary Jo's first time of doing that. You know, uh, we, we've only got about four, maybe five athletes on our team that can even think that way. She knew she had the point. So she didn't want to mess it up. So she dropped that ball. That's the strategy. And again, I've seen a competition where the um, referees, the volunteers will say, oh, you just dropped the ball. You didn't mean to do that. Here, let me pick it up and give it back to you. And you can go ahead and give it a real good throw and stuff. So again, it's one of those things. If you see things like that, the volunteers, remember these folks, they don't know all the ins and out and all the strategy that we teach our athletes. So please don't let that get away from them. And um, Ryan, go ahead and take that back. Do I have to say stop sharing? No, I think I just took it, Rennie. Okay. So any, any questions here? Oh, you had to slide up and you don't have it anymore. It's back, should be. Okay. Yeah, Rennie, it's uh, Jeff. Uh, the only thing I would clarify for coaches during competition that once the athletes go into the court, they can't go and start uh, uh, trying to coach them on that strategy correct? That's correct. Yeah. So once they enter the court, no more coaching. So the, the player has to use their own, their own skills and uh, experiences to know uh, when and it, when not to do that. Matter of fact, Jeff, um, 
to make it even more clear than that, it's not just the coaches that can't coach, but the teammates when you're playing on teams or unified doubles or, or, or doubles. The moment the athlete steps into the court, that's it. No one can coach. No one can talk to that athlete. So coach your athletes to stay outside of the court and talk it over with their teammates. What am I going to do? What side of the court am I going to stand on? And all those things can help. Now, folks, I realize that we're going to have quite a high number of athletes where this is impossible to coach um, because they're just not at that level of comprehending the game and stuff. But what I've also learned in the years that I've been doing this is there some of the quiet ones really have learned the game and the strategy and you just keep that bar in front of them and you make it high enough for them that it's achievable but it, so they're constantly striving for it and then when they achieve one level you bring it up another level again so really try for it it's amazing every year there's an athletes that surprises me this year. It was when Mary Jo dropped that ball. You know, I'd never seen her do that before. And when she did it at practice without any prompting or anything like that, it's that win that I'm looking for that, you know, in the win, in the sense that that athlete has accomplished something that she hasn't done before. And heck Mary Jo's played bocce longer than I have. And I can't even count how many years I've been coaching. Bocce. Mary Jo was already on the team when I joined um, the team. Next picture. Any questions? Um, so after all the balls are rolled, all four from each side, um, the frame is complete and the court officials awards the point. Um, remember, only one side gets points. Um, one point is awarded for each bocce ball of the same color, which is closer to the Polina, than the closest ball of the opposing team colors. Um, when, when balls are really close together, I strongly recommend you get your tape measure out. And we do have a picture later on on how to measure it. Don't we, Ryan? Do we still have that? Yeah, we do. I see it further down. Yep. And we can talk about that. Um, if, and I've seen this happen, if two balls, one red, one green, those two balls are the two closest ball to the Polina, and they're exactly the same distance apart. No points is awarded. You start that frame over again. Next slide, please. Ryan, was this where we were going to put the quiz? Yep. So just a, it'll be uh, two or three quick polls here uh, to make sure we're comprehending what we uh, just covered there. So the first one you'll see on your screen right now, uh, just pick your answer there. What team scored points? So either red or green here. And you can move the poll out of the way a little bit so that you can go back and look at the screen. Wait for two more to come in here. Ryan, be aware that my wife and I are both viewing and using one email address. Ah. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we'll stop it here. That's everybody. So everybody did get that correct. That's good news. All right, we will start the second poll here, still related to that picture in front of you. And you should see it on your screen now. How many points did that red team earn? All right, looks like we got everybody, Ryan. Mm -hmm. 
Again, 100% there. And then the final poll. Which team will roll the Polina to begin the next frame? I think somebody asked this question almost before we started. All right, I think we've got all the answers. The red is the correct answer, folks. Yep. Red is the closest, so they now have the advantage. Mm -hmm. If you were thinking that, well, wait a minute, this is in the middle of the game, there's still some balls to be rolled, you're absolutely right. Then the green would be the next one to roll. But in this case, all the balls have been rolled, so it's determining who will have the Polina advantage on the next one. Um, this one here talks about the placement of the foot. And like I said a little bit earlier, you know, we need to, an athlete can have their foot, must have their foot behind the foul line or can be on the foul line. I coach where they've got to always be behind the line. I don't coach where they can have their foot on the line. And, and the reason for that is because it becomes a really a judgment call as to did, did you have a quarter of an inch over the white, the foul line or not, you know, and I just don't want to get into those kinds of discussions um, when I'm in competition. Uh, we do allow athletes to have one foot in the court and one foot out of the court. And for some athletes, being able to have one foot out of it might give them an advantage in the angle that they're, they want to throw it the ball down. Again, you got to judge it. Is this an athlete that can understand the rules and the intricacy of the rules? You know, not everybody can. Again, and then when you're coach them to be able to have one foot out of it, it may cause some concerns at competition because the volunteers are not always aware that we can have that. Next slide, please. Um, Players may hit the sideboard and end boards with their bocce ball. If a ball is rolled and strikes another ball, or the balls and the rolled ball leaves the court, the play stand as it is, um, for, except that all of the balls that went out, they're out. All the balls that are in are okay. Um, if... If you roll it down, a ball down, and it gets on top of the sideboard or on top of the end board, it is ruled as a dead ball and removed from the court. Folks, the reality of life is for our Maryland competition, we use a round pipe. So if that ball rolls up on top of the pipe and rolls back down, as far as I'm concerned, Physics has taught me that it did not reach the top of the sideboard. Because if the, on a circular pipe, it's not possible. It's going to roll one way or the other. It's not going to stay there. This rule was really written because there's a lot of competition. And I know World Games have it that way. It isn't a pipe. It's a 2 by 8 or a 2 by 10 or something like that. So is it possible for a ball? to roll up on top of that two by whatever size it is and to stay up there? Yeah, likely, no. But anyways, that's where the rule comes from. If the Polina is hit out of the ball, out of the court, the frame is declared dead and you start over. And this time you stay at the same end. Don't move the, the athletes, don't move to the other end. Um, if a bocce ball, is hit out of the court by another bocce ball, it's also ruled um, dead and it's not placed back in 
the court. Next slide, please. Here's the slide that I wanted to talk a little bit about um, measuring. Um, when you folks look at this, the, the correct way to measure all the time is if you've got a tape that's a, a rolled up tape, or even if you take a yardstick or a piece of wood or anything like that, the, the free end of the measuring device that you're using should be up against the red ball. And the other end, the end that you're holding it, should be towards the polina and over the polina and then judge with your eye, where's the center of the polina? And that's where you read the tape measure, the yardstick or anything like that. And, and the reason you do that folks is when you push that tape measure up against the red ball, you're not likely to move it because you're not gonna be pushing it really hard. But if you do it the other way, and I've seen lots of times where we see that at competition, where they'll do it the other way and they'll push the tape up against the polina. That polina is a lot lighter and a lot easier to move. And then all of a sudden, all the dimensions have changed because that polina has been bumped a little bit. So that's important. Rabbit ears. Anybody have idea, any ideas of what they're talking about rabbit ears? See, I want to ask that question. Does anybody know why is rabbit ears put in here as a measuring device? So maybe when you stick a stick from the center of the polina to the edge of the red ball, it's rabbit ears. Nope. Close, but not there yet. Okay. How many of you remember the antennas on the television 20 or 30 years ago? The old rabbit ear antennas? You hit the two antennas? I know I've got people that are that old besides me. Yeah, like, you know, we're like you 40 remember. years. We're like 40 years, Rennie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's where it comes from. When I first joined the bocce team in Montgomery County, we had an older gentleman, Luch, and Luch at that time was the coach, and his dad was, would come and help out. And Luch had in his, or Luch's dad, and I forget what his name was, had a pair of these old rabbit ears antennas for the television in his pocket. And he would take them out and he would use it. So think of it like almost like a compass. And he'd open it up and he'd measure the distance between the ball and the, and the polina. And then he'd go to the next one and he'd see right off the bat. So he never really knew the exact distance between the balls but he knew that one was closer and one was longer simply by holding the, the rabbit ears and not moving it as he went from ball to ball. So that's where the rabbit ears is. Shows our age, I guess, for some of us. Next slide. All right, so here we'll have our next poll here. How do you properly measure a distance? Same thing Rennie just covered here. All right. I think we got all the scores. Ryan, what what were you thinking of this the difference between the center side and the front side? 
No, those Bunch. pretty much were the same. Uh, the one copied right out of the text would have been the second, Randy, but the concept's still the same, so that's still correct there. Okay. I was trying to make them a little confusing. The first couple were too easy. <laughs> All right, good job. Um, so that's somewhere continuing on with some of the rules. Uh, as we discussed earlier, the moment an athlete steps into a court, that's it. Nobody can talk to him anymore or her. The, there is an exception to every rule. There's always an exception. You know, if an athlete needs help to, <coughs> excuse me. Um, to even throw the ball because they can't do anything without some help, then in those cases, the, the coach can come in. Make sure that when you have athletes that need that kind of extra help, that you let the competition director know ahead of time so that they can be properly prepared to accommodate those um, athletes and everything. And then the next accommodation that we often see um, is visually um, impaired athletes. Um, in this case, really the only help that they can have is um, obviously to make sure that they know where the foul line is. And the other part is that one of the referees stands above the ball or just behind the polina, not the ball, but the polina, and, and says, I'm standing over or behind the polina. And that way, that athlete is visually impaired, can hear and decide how they're going to throw it, um, the ball in the direction of the sound. For some athletes, you actually don't have to use your voice. You can hold um, and what we do is we'll hold a pool noodle over the polina so that they can visually see. And, and for them, it's really, it's a fuzzy see. It's not a clear, oh, I see the, the polina. No, I see that there's this fuzzy line down there that's of a particular color that's different. And so they'll throw for that and stuff. So those are the accommodations that can be done. Again, it's important that you let the competition venue know that you need those um, accommodation and do it ahead of time uh, so that the, the athletes can be properly divisioned if needed, or they can be put with the right volunteers that can work with the athletes. Next slide, please. Uniform requirements. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, sorry. Um, we do have requirements on um, uniforms. And by the way, there are some exceptions to these rules also. So the athletes should have long pants or shorts. When we say shorts, um, we're talking about golf shorts or tennis shorts. It used to say, yeah, it, it does say that uh, two lines down. Short shorts are not permitted. Um, skirts are appropriate if they're not too short. Um, athletic shoes that do not damage or harm the playing surface is required. So for us, since most of our competition is outdoors and it's on grass, you know, tennis shoes. I can tell you that Towson would have a heart attack if you came around with um, soccer cleats or baseball cleats on their AstroTurf field. You know, that's a big no-no. Uh, <clears throat> and if you go to some competitions that are indoor and they're played on carpets and stuff, definitely have um, 
uh, sneakers and stuff like that. The, the other thing that I always stress here, never open toe shoes, never sandals, definitely not flip flop. Man, if that Polina drops on somebody's toe, everybody's going to hear about it and stuff because that athlete will let you know that that ball hit their toes. Uh, hats. Hats are permissible. And if you're out in the sun, it's highly encouraged to protect the athletes. Um, again, the hats should not have um, sponsorship or corporate logo. You know, try to find hats that are similar for all of the athletes. That gives them a distinguishing factor, makes a team spirit. Same thing with a collared shirt. Um, and it's always it's been required for a number of years. They all the athletes should be in the same colored colored shirt. Again, it helps the spirit. A year, a couple of years ago, we had an athlete that could not wear collared shirts. There, there was a re, you know, and I forget exactly what it was what the issue was um but because he couldn't wear it he had a t-shirt on that happened to be the same color as what the rest of the team was wearing the colors the rest of the team was wearing in the collar shirt and he got disqualified and that got challenged at that time by the head coach and it, it went to the rules committee, if I remember correctly, and we all said, wait a minute. The issue here is we need to have an accommodation because this athlete has a medical reason or something that it wasn't that he didn't want to wear it. He literally never wore a collared shirt and his family had tried it a number of times it, they just couldn't get him. And it wasn't just for Bocce, it was all the way around. So we said, all right, he really shouldn't have been disqualified, but you didn't turn that in as a required accommodation ahead of the competition. So the disqualification for Saturday stands, but we are well aware what's happening for Sunday. And therefore he's free to play Sunday with that accommodation. But again, it, it's got to be an accommodation that can be well documented. So that's why I say a lot of rules have got exceptions to it. You just got to make sure that everybody knows ahead of time. Next slide. So then our final poll here. Failed to launch poll. Oh, Jeff, so just so you know, Jeff's um, uh, connection dropped. So that's why he's not going to answer this question. So thank you. So what clothing from the following list is not prohibited? So what would an athlete be allowed to wear? And you can choose more than one answer here. I just tried to choose several and it wouldn't. Yeah, it's only it's only allowing one choice. Oh, okay. So, so pick the one that they are not allowed. What they're not allowed to wear? Okay. Well, no, wait a minute. There's multiple ones. So if it's yeah. not working right. It says yeah. not prohibited. That means what is allowed. Yes. Yeah. Right. No, I know. But when you guys said you've got multiple choice. Yeah, yeah well, there's two that they're not allowed to wear too. So. Right. I don't think we're going to do so well on this test. <laughs> so let's do it this way. Long, right? Skirts Hopefully. at appropriate length. Are they allowed that or not? Yes or no? Yes. 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 Jeans. No. No. That's right. That and by the way, jeans. I've I've seen it at state games where athletes were DQ'd on the grounds that they were wearing jeans. Yeah, it's always a good idea to bring an extra pair of pants. Right. All right. We got confused in the discussion. 
We added two. Yeah, it says what is not prohibited. Right. So skirts at the appropriate length are not prohibited. Exactly. Jeans are prohibited. Yeah, but that wasn't the question. Right, I understand. I'm, okay. So I'm, going, I'm going through line by line because we couldn't pick appropriately. I should running put, shorts. Right. Running shorts. Typically, most of the running shorts that I've seen are really short shorts. Right. So those are not acceptable. Golf or tennis shorts, those are acceptable. And hats without a sponsorship or corporate logo, those are also acceptable. Yeah, sorry about that. I didn't hit multiple choice before I added the poll and zoom there. Um, here's some training consideration to think about. Um, your coaching should always be centered around the athletes and the unified partner. The intention is to have the players always improving. And one thing that I like about Special Olympics is that some of our athletes are with us for decades. And over that decade, you can see steady progress every year. Not a huge amount, but steady progress. And it is so nice to see those players make that uh, steady progress year after year after year. And when they don't make that progress one year, you know, you, you kind of look at it and say, okay, they're plateauing. What do I have to do to turn that curve again and get them to start progressing again? And sometimes it'll happen that year. And other time it might happen the next year or the year after. But one thing I've learned is if you keep trying to get the athlete to improve, they will improve. Just a question of patience. Training session, you know, when you get to the way we run our training session, when the athletes before COVID-19, mind you, because I'm not going to go over the whole COVID-19 right now, but we'd have all the athlete would be, we'd have a quick team meeting at the beginning. I take attendance we go over some of the details that we want. We might have a warm-up activity, not always. Then everybody would go out to the different courts and I'd assign them to different cor courts with different coaches. And depending on which athletes it is and what's going on with those athletes, there might be some skill instruction. And the skill instruction might last half the practice. Um, Right now, we're doing essentially skill instructions all the time because we don't have the courts out there. And we're placing the polina, so we're controlling what the athletes are working on. Um, and then after, after the skill instruction, we'll actually have competition um, at the different courts. And then towards the end, we'll give them, we'll let everybody know five, 10 minutes before the end of practice that, you know, finish out this frame or play one more frame. And the athletes kind of take it easy and get it done. And then if there's one more message that we have to give out to anybody, we give it then. But typically the only thing that we do towards the end of the game is if we want athletes to take home a piece of paper, that's when we hand it out. We don't hand it out earlier because it gets lost. Next slide. Um, so when you're working on skills, think about different ways that you, or different strategies and drills that you'd like. Place the polina right at the midline. Place the polina almost at the end of the field. Place the polina again along the rails. You know, if it's right up against the rail, there is no rule 
like there is in some of the, and I'm trying to, the high school may have that rule of where they move the polina out a foot from the side rail. Not for us. Put it up against. That's a tough play. Athletes, they've got to learn how to play when the polina is up against the rail because within Maryland, there are a number of athletes when they throw that polina, they're going to put it up against the rail because they know it gives them an advantage. So train your athletes on how to react to if they get that. Train your athlete on bouncing their balls off of the rail back into the uh, court to do that banking so they can get around some of the balls. We talked a little bit earlier, you know, some athletes are good at short throws so they can throw a blocking ball. Some athletes are really good at rolling really fast and hard. They can use that to knock the polina out, to knock balls out of the way. So those are all kinds of things that you want to kind of get your athletes used to that and find out which athletes are good at what. And then think about how do you pair two athletes together? Sometimes putting an athlete that's good in one kind of activity or one kind of a strategy with somebody that's radically different may be an advantage in getting things done. Um, you know, they, they'll score better. They'll be better team players. We've seen where some athletes, no matter how much you train them, they always throw the, plane, the balls long. You can't get them to throw short. I've paired up some of those athletes with somebody that always throws short because then if the opposing team sends the polina way down, I've got one team member that can handle that without any problem. And if the opposing team short throws a short polina, then the other team member can step up and get the points. So think about those strategies. Next slide. Training, get the best thing that you can. You know, it says here, mow the grass when possible. Get to know your uh, rec departments, people. Ask them if they can mow the lawns, you know. Oh, Jeff, this is your reminder that you got to call the rec department. So Saturday we got mowed lawn. And if Jeff's not back on, Tina, you remind him. Yeah, I'm back on. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a struggle. It's a struggle. You know, they they got a lot going on in Montgomery County. Um, you know, in the past we've always had solid court barriers, wood. In our case, it's PVC. This year, with COVID nineteen, we decided we weren't going to have any of the equipment beyond the balls simply because we didn't want to go through all the disinfection. So, um, you know, we do what we can. Um, I've seen on the internet, and I don't know if anybody has ever tried that, um, there, there are some courts that are made out of um, nylon tape or ropes and stuff, and they're the exact dimension, and you just lay them out and you put a couple of stakes in the ground to hold them down. We didn't even go to that route because again, you're, you've got during COVID-19, you know, somebody has got to touch those things. And then what do you do about um, the requirements that you got to clean between people touching it? So this year's an exceptional year. Um, what we did do to, we, we are demarket marking the court outline. So I come with a can of spray paint and I paint the foul line in the grass. And um, we then put cones at the corners of the foul line. And the athletes know they've got to stay within those dimensions to, um, to stay within the courts. Uh, the bocce balls, you see the dimensions here 
it's hard to find balls that aren't the right weight and dimension. Yeah, you can find them, but it's very easy also to find the balls that have this dimensions. And again, you know, if your athlete can't see green well on green grass because they're visually impaired, take a look about getting another color. So you have red and yellow, red and blue, you know, there, there are other colors that are out there. That makes life a whole lot easier for those athletes. And again, when we go to competition at state games, put that in the, you know, your registration and Ryan will work with you, with your athletes so that they have a good competition. Next slide. Um, as we talked about before, some boards are made with lumber. Other boards, you know, in our, in our case, we have two inch PVC pipe. The state uses four inch PZ, PVC pipe. The gutters, I've, I've seen some designs and stuff. My recommendation is stay away from the aluminum, aluminum. gutters Gutter. and go to the PVC. They're actually a lot sturdier in the long run that those aluminum um, gutters will bend. Um, and so they'll have an impact on how the players play, especially when they're playing up against um, the boards and stuff. Uh, both the PVC pipe and the gutters, you can buy them in 10 foot length. So it makes it easy to uh, put up a 60 foot long um, playing field. Um, and finally, um, round side versus flat tops. You know, I talked about that earlier. If you've got a round pipe, that ball either stays in or it goes out. If it goes out, it's a dead ball. If it stays in, if it goes up on the, the pipe and rolls back in, that ball's still good. That's a fair play. On the flat top, it becomes a judgment call. You know, that that ball rolled up onto the two by four or the two by eight and it rolled down a foot and then it rolled back into the court. Technically, it was on top of the flat top and it could, it could be called a dead ball. The divisioning process. Uh, this particular slide here is one that I, that I put in if any of you want to get it in a spreadsheet format, let me know, because I've built this as a spreadsheet, and the, in, and the intention on this was that it would do the scores, you know, where it says scores in inches, that is actually the results of what was entered in the three boxes or the three columns to the left. Um, the reason I put in eight um, measurements rather than just the three that are required. And I put him, I measure the balls always from the closest ball to the Polina to the, and the last ball is always the furthest away. But the first three scores are the critical ones. So you always want to get the cl three closest balls in the first three lines. The reason I have that is because I use it to understand how well does an athlete um, throw the ball? Is, are they consistent? Are they grouping their balls or are they just all over the map? And that helps me make decisions when I try to form um, teams. Any questions on this one? And it, as I said, if if you want this and you don't have my email, ask Ryan for my email and I'll gladly send out the um, Excel spreadsheet to you folks. Susan, I saw you raise your hand. I'll make sure you get it. Was that the... Yep. Any questions? We'll take it here or we'll go to the additional resources. Uh, Ryan, you are going to send these slides out after the training 
Of course, yep. Uh, they'll also, the recording will be on the coaches resource page tomorrow, uh, pending YouTube's time of processing, which uh, depends per day, um, but expected to be up tomorrow on the page. Thank you. And what I might also do is I will uh, put that spreadsheet up with the divisioning on that page also. I think that can be helpful um, and just easier access for everybody if that works. Okay, then I'll send okay. it to you. Thank you. I... Thank you. And last slide. Here are some resources. Um, the first one is an excellent one. That's where I went, you know, Ryan asked me a question about the rules and he says, Rennie, I couldn't find it. I found the rule. I went in here on the SOI and sure enough, I could find the, the rule that he was talking about without any problem. Yep. And that is the most up-to-date one. And that's also on the coach's resource page. Uh, the second one, Rennie, correct me if I'm wrong, is more of a uh, coaching resources on how to coach and everything along that yeah. uh, from SOI, which can be really helpful, uh, whether you're a new coach or a returning coach. So at this time, that's the end of the PowerPoint. Uh, are there any questions at this time? While you're thinking about it, uh, June 12th at Towson is tentatively the date for summer games. Uh, Steve's been working really hard with them. He had a call uh, with who we currently work with there today. Um, I have not heard an update yet, um, but I believe we're still on for Towson. Um, I'm working on a one pager, kind of laying out like you see in the event guide of timing and everything like that. So it is coming together uh, and you should have more information about that soon. That is, is that to be, are we allowed to tell our athletes or do you'd rather ho we hold off on it? Uh, at this point, you can tell them it's tentative. Uh, that's the date we're looking at. Athletics will be the 13th, most likely. So that'll be the Sunday after. Uh, so Bocce Saturday, Athletics Sunday. Um, if that changes, I'll let you know. <laughs> Any other questions? Question. Yeah, um, I have one question. He sure. mentioned earlier about uh, very few, but some athletes throw the bocce ball overhanded. And I've noticed in state that there have been times when athletes have been disqualified because even though they were releasing underhanded, they were releasing above their waist and they were being disqualified. That no, releasing above the waist, no matter how you hold the ball, is what disqualifies you. It should not be because you're holding it one way, you know, overhand or underhand. And if if you're getting those kinds of disqualification, um, then you got to say something to your head coach so your head coach can approach the correct official. And usually those guys are be over there in no time at all to correct the problems. Yeah, Rennie, I, th I think when you use the term overhand, people are thinking like a baseball throw. Yeah, where no. you're, I think, talking about the way you cut the ball, you can ro throw it, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so yeah, it's still, you can't throw it above the under, waist yeah. or under, you know, and I'm trying to show it. Right. Okay, when you mentioned overhand, I thought you were mentioning overhand like baseball because I've no. seen them do like that in Little, in little Italy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, so. don't get me started on what I saw in Little Italy. Um, I, I went for a training one year. Um, Jason um, took us to Little Italy for, for a training session. And my Lord, what those people can do um, when they are playing in bocce so they're pretty amazing and that's after they've drank i don't know five or six glasses of wine and they're not small wine glasses folks they <laughs> yeah they seem to get better the more glasses they have that's true <laughs> and Rennie, that ball being thrown above the waist is that something that is protestable or is that left up uh to the official at that time it, it's up 
you know, if, if an athlete goes above the waist, the official on the court should call it. If he calls it, you know, the only thing you can do at that point is to remind your athlete, don't throw it above the waist, you know. Now, we focus on that at practice. You know, I didn't, I didn't show you the clip where Mary Jo threw one of her balls on another frame and she released it above her waist. And I said something to her. I said, Mary Jo, you can't throw it up that high. And she said, all right. And you know, it's practice. So it happens and she corrected herself and she didn't do it again at practice. Now, one year at state game, we had a big brouhaha around the fact that one athlete was throwing with both hands. Folks, if you have any difficulties there, say something. You know, if your athlete typically uses two hands, put it in the registration for the games that your athlete uses two hands. Again, sometimes people will call you on it because there are some rules that are written. It's supposed to be a one hand throw. But the fact is we're Special Olympics and that's an accommodation we make. And we don't sit here in judgment trying to figure out well, this athlete should be strong enough to do it one hand. Nope. That's the way the athlete plays and does it with two hands and does three throws two-handed and then spends the rest of the afternoon with one hand. Well, that's what that athlete decided. And that's okay. Just let folks know ahead of time. Yeah, ba basically, any exception should be listed when they're registered. Correct. You know, whether they're using the same weight ball, but a smaller diameter or a lightweight ball, or they, you know, can't go, they can't go back and forth. Yeah, no, Abby's absolutely right, because Abby's got some athletes that can't go back and forth, and Montgomery County's got some also so we've just learned we put everything in there and, Any other what's, questions, and what's nice is that for the last few years the state has put those accommodation that are needed on the paperwork that goes out to the courts so that the volunteers and the referees have that at the start of that particular game. And so we've seen a lot less issues happen because they're aware of what, what are the accommodations we have to have. All right, at this point, I'll stop the recording. Thank you everyone very much for joining tonight. 